Hi, everybody. It is your AP Biology teacher, Mr. Poser. Today, we're getting into topic 4.2, and that is on the introduction to signal transduction. In our last topic, we talked about, well, cell communication and the three different ways that cells communicate. Um, today, we are going to get into some of the specifics of how cells are able to take in signals and, you know, do something with it and cause a response to that signal, right? It's one thing to, uh, you know, send a text. It's another thing to receive it. Um, or have some kind of response to some kind of message that you were getting. Um, so I have a picture here of some relay racers. Um, and this instead of something like a cell or a, I don't know, some kind of biochemical pathway or like some kind of protein or whatever, I have just a picture of some relay racers and I'm hoping that you're gonna figure out why here uh, by the end of the video. So in our last topic, like we said, we talked about three different forms of cellular communication. We talk, talked about direct contact signaling, we talked about local signaling, and we talked about long distance or uh, endocrine signaling, right? And here they are, here's direct contact, the cells are touching each other um, to transmit information. Uh, here's local signaling, right? They're sending signals to each other over a short distance, and then here's long distance or endocrine signaling um, and these this red molecule must be like a hormone um, that's traveling through the bloodstream or something like that but here's my question for you cells signal each other in different ways but how do these cause a response right so uh, how do we get from cause to effect here um, and that's what we're going to be looking at today all right so uh, as we looked at it in our last topic right cells can receive signals in de uh, several different ways right they can be from direct contact they can be from uh, short over a short distance or they can be over a long distance and as a result of receiving that signal they cause a response all right and uh, well cells need to be told what to do right so like for example uh, liver cells when they receive a signal called insulin um, which we talked about in our last topic insulin will force some of those cells to take in glucose from their bloodstream and the absorption of glucose from the bloodstream is the response okay but how do we get from the signal to the response. That's what's called signal transduction, and that's the main topic for today. All right, it is the intermediate between receiving a signal and doing something about it, reacting to it, responding to it. All right, um, because cells need to be told, well, the cells tell each other what to do all the time. Um, so all those hormones that we talked about, right? So telling another body part what to do. And this is, uh, those are cellular responses. Um, and that can't happen without signal transduction. And here you go. So signal transduction involves a cell taking in a signal so that it can produce a response to it. It links reception with response, okay? So it's taking in a signal that it receives and causing response to it. Um, and those responses could be anything from like, all right, cell, you should continue to grow. All right, cell, you should divide. Okay, cell, uh, secrete this molecule and signal this molecule. Or hey, cell, create this protein. Or in some circumstances, hey, cell, self-destruct. That, that, that happens sometimes, all right? We'll talk about that more later on uh, this unit, okay? But signal transduction is taking in the reception of that signal and then, uh, you know, causing something to happen, all right? And here's a overview of what this is all about here. All right, signal transduction can get very, very complicated. Um, signal transduction pathways are, well, they're very, very diverse and there's lots of different proteins um, and other sorts of molecules that are involved in signal transduction pathways. But here's the here's the overview of it, right? Reception means taking a uh, taking a chemical signal and it binds to a protein called a receptor. All right. And that receptor causes a whole bunch of reactions that usually happen kind of like a relay race um, that will eventually produce the re desired response by the cell. OK, so this is what signal transduction is taking this message and relaying it inside to the cell so the cell does something um, in response to that signal. Okay, um, we're going to look at several different ways that that can happen, just a kind of an overview. But in order for signal transduction to begin or a cell communication to begin, a chemical signal called a ligand binds to a specific receptor protein in a target cell <coughs> sent from a local or distant cell. Okay, so we looked at local uh, signaling and we looked at long distance signaling. Those bo both involve chemical signals, right? We looked at neurotransmitters and hormones. Those are both examples of what are called ligands, all right? And these are chemicals that are going to bind to a protein on the surface of a cell or sometimes inside of a cell. All right, ligands some can sometimes be peptides. They can be proteins as well. All right, but check out this picture down here, right? The ligand binds to a receptor. All right. Um, on the outside, when the part of the receptor that's on the outside of the cell, and it causes a change in the protein on the inside of the cell, and that can initiate a 
cascade of responses. Okay, so uh, ligands and receptor proteins, while we talked about um, enzymes and substrates in our last unit, the relationship between an enzyme and a substrate, how a substrate can only really bind to one enzyme and can make one reaction happen, that's very similar to how a ligand binds to a receptor, right? If I'm diabetic and I take some insulin, okay, the insulin that's now flowing in my bloodstream is not going to bind to any other receptor. It's not going to bind to a, I don't know, human growth hormone receptor. Um, it's not going to bind to a testosterone receptor, whatever, okay? It's only going to bind to that one receptor. They are specific for each other, all right? So the shape of the receptor, uh, the binding domain, as we call it, of the receptor is specific for a ligand, all right? And I'm gonna show you that here and again. All right, here's my receptor protein. And there's part of it that sticks outside of the cell and there's part of it that sticks inside of the cell. Here's my ligand. The part that's outside of the cell is called the ligand binding domain, as we're going to find out here, the ligand binds to that part. And then the part that's going to change shape and cause uh, signal transduction is called the, called the intracellular domain, intra meaning inside. All right, so uh, here's my ligand. There it goes, bink. It's gonna, uh, it's gonna bind to the ligand binding domain of that receptor protein. And uh, while well, the protein's gonna change shape as a result of that ligand binding. All right, and the changing of that shape of that protein is going to cause some transduction, all right? It's gonna cause a um, relay, kind of a cascade, a domino effect of um, changes in proteins in order to cause a cellular response, all right? So it can get pretty complicated, all right? Um, I just wanna illustrate here that some receptor proteins are not on the plasma membrane. They're not on the surface of the cell. They are inside the cell, hence they are intracellular. So uh, some ligands are able to pass through the membrane um, rather than uh, you know staying outside like this, okay? and uh, they can cause some signal transduction pathways as well. Most commonly associated with gene expression, um, those intracellular receptors are. And if you don't know what gene expression is yet, it's uh, using a gene, a DNA, to make a protein. We spend a whole unit on it. It's, that's what unit six is about. So if you don't know yet, you will, trust me. All right, um, so here's an example of some proteins, some well-known proteins. They're called GPCRs or G-protein coupled receptors. Um, and this is kind of what they look like up here. This green molecule up here is a ligand. It will bind to the GPCR. Um, and then the in intracellular domain, the uh, part of the receptor that's inside of the cell will change shape um, and it'll activate something called a G-protein, hence G protein coupled receptor. Um, and it has three different subunits here. There's alpha and beta and gamma, uh, the three different subunits of that G protein. Okay. Um, but the gist here is that when the ligand binds, it causes a change in the shape of the receptor and it activates this what's called G protein. Um, and how is that G protein activated? Well, it's G, it's uh, activated through what's called phosphorylation. Okay, we know what phosphorylation is. It's the transfer of a phosphate. All right, that's come up a couple times already. Phosphorylation, um, transferring of a phosphate from one molecule to another. So that's coming back here um, in signal transduction. This is activated through phosphorylation. It's taken a phosphate group. Okay, so uh, here's another schematic again, all right, of uh, signal transduction. Here's my ligand, binds to a receptor, um, causes this change of the shape of the receptor, the intracellular, all right, and it can uh, cause signal transduction. And signal transduction is often done through what are called kinases and through second messengers. I, I will enzymes in general, kinases were, are a specific kind of enzyme um, that I'm going to be showing you here in just a second. Hey, so we're going to talk about what both of these are, kinases and second messengers, um, and the roles that they play in signal transduction. All right, kinases, we'll start there, are enzymes that transfer phosphates, there it is, ph phosphorylation again, from ATP or sometimes from GTP to other molecules to activate them and relay a signal. All right, so here's a picture of a phosphorylation um, a signal transduction cascade, all right, or a signal transduction pathway. Um, and as you can see, it can, can get, you know, pretty complicated, but there's our ligand binding to the receptor, causing a change. Um, and what's what all these things are, are down here are proteins that are activating one another, usually through phosphorylation. Um, one protein passes a phosphate to another and passes a phosphate to another and go so on and so forth until the desired cellular response is, uh, is acquired or is, or is reached. Okay, so they're kind of passing a signal along to each other, kind of like in a relay race. One runner passes a baton to another one, and then it goes, and then, you know, you know how a relay works? Yeah, um, it kind of works in that similar way, all right, until it reaches the, reaches the goal. Okay, so just to illustrate how kinases work here, uh, let's just say this protein up here is a kinase. Um, it's going to take some ATP. 
hmm, all right, where's it gonna get that phosphate from? It's gonna get it from ATP, uh, which means that uh, you probably know by now, if ATP is dropping off of phosphate, it's gonna become ADP. And there's that phosphate. And this protein is now, well, it's kind of activated, right? It has a phosphate group um, and it, it can now activate another protein. That's what uh, kinases do, all right? So it takes that phosphate from ATP, all right? And then what it can do is transfer over that phosphate from one from itself to another, all right? And by extension here, this protein is now activated and that protein can well, either pass along that phosphate, or maybe if it's an enzyme, it can start catalyzing reactions um, that have to do with that cellular response. Okay, so that's what kinases do. They pass along phosphates um, in order to activate other proteins. So many signal transduction pathways involve phosphorylation cascades where phosphates are transferred between several different kinases. So if you look at this picture down here, check it out. Protein one is inactive until it's phosphorylated. It has a phosphate and now it's active. Then it passes that phosphate to protein two, which is active once it has that phosphate. And then the, this other protein, ATM down here, um, get, uh, gets that phosphate group, it gets transferred that phosphate group, and now it's active and it can cause a cellular response here. Okay, um, so a lot of signal transduction pathways evolve involve phosphorylation cascades. Hey, you take this phosphate and you pass it along, then you pass it along, pass it along, so and forth, like a relay race, okay? Um, so that's one way that cells can take in a message from the outside and bring it in to cause a cellular response. Now, the other thing that I want to talk about here with cell signal transduction pathways is when a signal needs to get amplified. Okay, and that involves what are called second messengers. So I put signals can be amplified with second messengers, which are small molecules that can activate many pathways. Okay, so think of it this way. All right, um, if you've taken psychology before, you might know something called a fight or flight response, right? And a fight or flight response is when, you know, um, your body readies itself for, to either fight for its life or run for its life. Okay, it's like kind of like a high stress situation, right? You're walking in the woods, you see a bear, and the bear is gonna like mess you up, right? Um, what you, what's gonna happen? Your heart rate's gonna start to increase, your breathing rate starts to increase, your digestion slows down, your awareness increases, a whole bunch of stuff happens. Now, that's because this the epinephrine, which is an adrenaline, it's a hormone, it's a ligand, okay? Um, that's going to bind to certain cells, and now the, the signals, um, or excuse me, the responses that that signal is going to cause are many, right? It's going to cause a whole lot of different changes. Um, and that's in large part due to what are called second messengers. It can amplify a pathway and it can activate a whole lot of different pathways. Um, and I'm gonna show you a schematic here. And the most famous uh, uh, second messenger that there is is called cyclic AMP or a more affectionately known as CAMP. Um, it is a very, very well-known second messenger. And we'll, I'll show you here what it does. Okay, um, so CAMP is uh, short for cyclic AMP, um, and that might sound familiar, ATP, ADP, right? Okay, um, CAMP is produced by an enzyme called adenylate cyclase, okay? Um, so when this enzyme is activated, and it's uh, usually on the plasma membrane, it's activated by a phosphate, um, by phosphorylation, it turns on, and what it can do is cause ATP to can get converted into cyclic AMP. All right, so ATP, the T and T, or uh, the T and ATP stands for tri. Um, so can you guess what the M stands for in cyclic AMP? It stands for mono, right? So uh, it only has one phosphate, right? Adenylate cyclase is going to convert ATP to cyclic AMP. And now, um, if this reaction happens a bunch of different times, all right, it's going to produce a lot of cyclic AMP and activate a whole lot of different pathways at the same time. Okay, um, so it can, it can, you know, take one signal and branch that signaling transduction pathway into a whole bunch of different ways, um, depending on how much cyclic AMP is produced. All right, so as I put here, cyclic AMP is produced in large amounts and can activate many other signal uh, cascades. It can start a whole lot of different pathways, right? If you think kinases, all right, they put, go from one protein to another, to another, to another, to another, right? Cyclic AMP can initiate a whole lot of different other pathways um, and activate a whole lot of different other proteins. Okay, because there's just so many of it, and that's what's called a second messenger. Okay, um, the last thing I'm going to talk about here um, with signal transduction pathways, sometimes signal transduction pathways can be initiated by electrochemical gradients, right? The inflow of ions, um, and that can be done through what's called ligand-gated ion channels. So here's my, uh, oops, here's my 
animation again. Let me try that. There we go. Okay, the ligand binds to the receptor of a ligand-gated ion channel, and guess what it does? Well, the ion channel can open up. Okay, sometimes ligands can bind to an ion channel and it causes the ion channel to close. Mine here is going to open. Um, so check it out. The ligand binds, the channel opens up, and then, you know, what can happen with ion channels is that it can let ions into a cell. All right, because remember, ions can't pass through the bilayer on their own. They're too charged, right? They can't get through the bilayer on their own, so they need a channel to go through facilitated diffusion. Um, and ligand-gated ion channels are ones that open up in response to a ligand binding to them, and therefore they're a type of receptor as well. All right, um, that is it here. Okay, so let's talk about our recap in case you missed anything or in case I missed anything. Uh, signal transduction, what is it? It occurs between the reception of a signal by a cell and the response it produces to that signal. It's the intermediate step. Um, it begins when a ligand, which is a chemical signal molecule, binds with a receptor on the surface of a cell or inside of a cell um, in the cytosol. And the example that we looked at of a receptor is a GPCR and a ligand-gated uh, ion channel. Um, but when it comes to a receptor protein, there's a ligand binding domain that's outside of the cell. Okay, and it only binds with specifically one ligand, right? So insulin receptors are not going to bind with anything but insulin. Um, and the intracellular, intracellular domain of that receptor changes shape um, and initiates a signal transduction pathway when that ligand binds, all right? Just like we looked at before. Um, signaling pathways relay signals from receptors to target parts of the cell, all right? So once that ligand binds, receptor changes shape, then the real action starts to happen. Um, the receptor changes shape and um, gets phosphorylated. It can be, that phosphorylation cascade can occur through kinases. Um, that can cause, that signal can be amplified through second messengers, right? It can start, turn on adenylate cyclase and start producing CAMP and amplify a signal, start a whole bunch of different responses. Um, and those signals can open ligand-gated ion channels to change electrochemical gradients. All right, um, I think that is it for this. We're going to get into some more examples of signal transduction pathways um, in the next topic in 4.3. Please let me know if you have any questions, and we will see you next time.